So today we will talk about uh, Word and document embeddings. This is a continuation from um, Monday when we talked about more semantic ways to uh, represent text and text documents. Just uh, as a brief reminder, so our first approach to text um, representation was bag of words. But the restrictions of that or limitations were that the semantics of words are not captured. Each word is just modeled as a discrete uh, entity. So synonyms and word meanings are not represented. And it's also very distributed and possibly hard to grasp understanding. Uh, sorry, hard to understand representation of a document. So last time we looked at latent semantic analysis, non-negative matrix factorization, and latent directly allocation. These usually uh, embed documents in um, corpus-specific continuous space. So they're basically so, some way of a latent representation or a factorization of your data that is usually done, well, you have an embedding for each document, and it is done uh, for a particular data set. Today, we will uh, embed words, mostly, and we want to embed them in a general space. The idea here is that if we use enough data, we can create a representation that's generic enough that um, we can use it for many applications. So the semantics of a given word don't really change that much from application to application, and uh, I don't need to learn synonyms again over and over for each new data set and new task. So we want to learn a more semantic representation that we can use in general uh, for a specific language. Um, the idea this will work is we will use an unsupervised feature extraction method using a large enough corpus. So this could be many news articles, or it could be Wikipedia, or it could be a collection of books. So we want a really, really big corpus of text data. The, we will start with representing every word using the one hot representation or a bag of word approach. So uh, we'll model each of them as a discrete entity, but then we will learn a continuous representation for each word that will be more semantic than this uh, one-hot encoding or this back-of-word representation. And uh, we'll use what I'll call an auxiliary task to learn this continuous representation. So last time we also had some unsupervised objectives and we didn't really talk about why is this objective the objective that we're interested in? Um, here, our end goal is to probably do supervised learning, um, but in general have a representation, and we'll come up with a task that will help us to learn this representation, even though we're not really interested in the task itself. And so the most common one is what is known as the skip gram model. The, t the auxiliary task here is given a word, predict its surrounding words. So in a sense, this is, um, you can formulate this as a supervised task where we can generate arbitrary uh, many samples. Given any document, we can just sample a word and then we can sample the words in its surrounding and we can try uh, to predict the, wor uh, the words in the surrounding from the given word. Clearly, this is like impossible to do right. There's many different words that could appear around a given word. But if we train a model that is able to model what are surroundings were, surrounding words likely to be, um, this will, it turns out, this will give us a nice representation um, that might work across many tasks. So uh, here's an example. Let's say you have uh, two documents. Uh, what is my purpose? And you pass the butter. Then, um, so for example, the input might be is, and the context would be what and my. And so you try, given the input is, 
to try to predict or to try to learn a model that can predict what and my. Clearly, for these like very small uh, samples, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if you think about things that appear in context uh, over a large collection, and some things are more likely to appear in some context than others. So here, this example is you predict the word before and after. In practice, you will usually use um, something like five or ten. So you pick a word and you pick the uh, surrounding five or ten words in each direction, and you try to predict those. Um, here is a nice representation that I stole from this uh, blog, book, blog post um, of like how this works. This is a neural, like they say, it's a neural net. It's not really a neural network. It's more like um, PCA logistic regression in a sense. So on the left, you have the input vector. So you have a single word that is the word um, that I'm starting from. And so this is just like the bag of words. Let's say we have uh, here in this example, there's 10,000 words in the vocabulary. I have a count of one for the word that is the central word. And then my output is a softmax classifier, which is basically um, the same as multinomial logistic regression, only uh, that you allow more than one thing to be um, active, I think. Yeah. Um, and so the, the output is basically as big as the vocabulary. So again, you have 10,000 uh, output neurons or basically 10,000 probabilities that say how likely is it to find um, this second word in the context of this first word. So, and he chose the word ants. I have nothing to do with this. Um, so the question is then, um, Okay, how, how does it work internally? And actually internally it's very simple. It's just um, a linear hidden layer, which means just two matrix multiplications. Um, so this is, in a sense, exactly the same as logistic regression, only that you have a, sort of a low rank constraint on the matrix. So you say, oh, I require my model to project down to uh, 300 dimensions before I can make my predictions. And I learn this projection down to 300 dimensions together with um, the softmax classifier that's behind it. And so this thing is basically just two matrix multiplications. I have this, this other diagram here, which shows this maybe a little bit better. So there's no nonlinearity or anything in here. We just have our V, say, 10,000 dimensional input layer, it's just one one at one place for the single word that uh, we're looking at. And um, you have this W, that's um, number of words in vocabulary times size of the hidden representation. And then you have from the hidden representation uh, to the output layer. A connection, say, for the word before and for the for a word after or for whatever C many words in the surrounding. And so all these outputs share the same weight matrix um, W prime. That's again number of um, hidden dimensions or latent representation dimension n times number of vocabulary V. So this is yeah, this is quite related to things that we've seen before. Um, though people like to call it a neural network for some reason. And um, we basically throw away this W prime, and we only care about this W. And this W is now for each word. Remember, a word is like just a one in the input that selects a column of W. And so the columns of W are um, the latent representations. So um, for each word, I get in this case here, a 300 dimensional representation of that word, which is the projection of that word to this uh, hidden layer. Sometimes this is called uh, a bottleneck because basically we are restricting ourselves to not go directly from the input to the output, but we have to go through these uh, just 300 neurons, which is a much smaller dimensionality of the input space. 
And so you can think of this as like maybe a sort of a supervised version of some PCA, which um, basically tries to model context. Um, here is the, the training loss, which is uh, basically the same as in logistic regression. Um, so you want, let's say, um, WT, T is the position where, where I have my current word, and J is like, uh, goes from minus five to five, say, so the five words before and the five words after, and I want to maximize the probability of these words given the word I observed. And um, this is just a linear prediction where uh, you have these, uh, these are now the two weight matrices, uh, here they're called V, and um, so VWI would be the, um, the, the word embedding, so it's the representation of the input word WT, or it's like zero times, uh, sorry, it's like this one hot encoded vector times the column of the input matrix, and V prime O would be the, um, the column of W prime corresponding to the output word, and you normalize it by all other words. So this is, in a sense, this is pretty straightforward. Um, what's a little bit tricky is that here the sum in the bottom goes over all possible words. So you normalize, the, like if you, if you think of the as, as logistic regression, you have um, as many outputs as there's words in the vocabulary. That's very many. You want to probabilities to sum to one. Um, that's, uh, computing this every time would be very expensive. And so people do like a stochastic approximation. Actually, going to talk about stochastic approximations a little bit uh, later today, uh, because they will be very important for neural networks. But basically, um, instead of dividing by the sum over all words, you just um, sample some words that don't appear in the context and say make the words uh, more likely that appear in the context, make the words less likely that don't appear in the context. And that way, you get like a thousandfold speed up. Oh, by the way, this is the uh, the paper. This is like pretty classical now. Six years after, it's pretty famous um, because they basically uh, created a whole new subfield by creating these word representations. So what I talked about so far is the skip gram. You can also do the same thing, but the other way around, and it's called uh, SIBO or continuous bag of words. <coughs> And um, in the SIBO, I don't know how you pronounce this actually. Let's say we, we pronounce it this way. Um, model, you take all the surrounding words, all the context words, and try to predict the, the word in the middle. This is called a continuous back of words because, again, you look at all the context words uh, here, they all share um, this the same input matrix, basically. So that means um, instead of having counting um, one for each of the words, just as you would do in back of words, you just have a continuous representation and you sum up the continuous representations of all the words in the context. And from this sum, which is again sort of like a bag because you don't care about the order, from this sum you try to predict the center word. And uh, People have sort of argued with which one is better. Um, there's different implementations that are very good for both of these. Um, you probably know the implementation of word to vec um, I think they also actually implement both. So, or, okay, maybe maybe questions so far. Yeah, so here is the structure of the skip gram. So the input is um, just a binary vector of the length of the vocabulary, and you just have a one at the place that corresponds to your input word. You have the output layer is exactly the same, where you have, let's say, you, or 
you re basically you repeat what happens in the output layer for each word in the context. Let's say you look at one particular word in the context that's like close to the first word. Um, so then you put it basically what you were trying to predict is a one there and a zero for all the other words in vocabulary that don't appear in the context. And um, so what you're trying to learn is a softmax or just a regression classifier basically that um, predicts a one for a word in the context and a zero for everything else. And um, but instead of just having um, an output uh, like uh, or having a single vector or a single matrix that you would ha have in logistic regression. Here we have two matrices, so we factor this uh, matrix that goes from the input to the output into um, vocabulary size times latent dimensions and latent dimensions times vocabulary size. So there's these two matrices here, and um, instead of like learning a full matrix. And the point is that basically the model is forced to learn this 300 dimensional representation, which is a projection of the input space, and it needs to compress all the information in this 300 dimensional, um, in, in this 300 dimensional latent space. And so this is the representation we're really interested in. And this representation corresponds, you could say, to the, um, to the columns of the input layer, of these input matrix. No, in the context window, I think uh, both of these approaches don't care about the word order. It's just a binary. Are you in the context or are you not in the context? Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you represent a word in this 300 dimensional space, in the language of neural networks, you would say that um, the activation on the hidden layer would be the re representation of the word, right? Yeah, in terms of neural networks, uh, yes, you said the activation of the hidden layer is the representation of the word, um, which is because it's a linear layer and it, the input is one hot, it's just a single column. But it, yes, it's the activation of the hidden, uh, hidden layer. Are there people who have tried to introduce non-linearity to that? Okay, question is, are, have people tried to do non-linearities? Actually, non-linearity came before that and they showed it works even without it. But people have tried everything. Uh, so this is a method that now is like six years old, I think. Um, it's still uh, used by a lot of people. Um, I actually, so there's a more powerful method that uses very complex neural networks that is state of the art now. I wanted to use them uh, next Monday, but I decided I'm gonna talk about all the other like more simple neural networks first, and then once we went through all the neural networks, I'll come back to the text data and I'll try to explain these much more complex models. Um, which are for some reason named after um, Sesame Street characters, Elmo and Bert. Um, okay. But so here, yes, if you think about it in terms of neural networks, this is a very, very simple model, but it still works pretty well. Okay, so implementations. We're actually gonna uh, use uh, Jensen, um, but there's many, many implementations um, so Jensen is a library for um, unsupervised learning in Python. Uh, the implementation, I think VirtuVec was the Google implementation. Now there's TensorFlow implementations. There's one by Facebook that you, does this and related techniques called fast text that works very well. Um, so basically don't implement this yourself and also don't train this yourself. The longer you train and the bigger the corpus is that you train this on, the better the quality of the vectors will be, unless you have a very, very specific domain or a language for which you can't just download it. To, uh, if you're using like general domain English language, just download the weights that Google trained for you or that Facebook trained for you because they probably have more compute power than you do. So I'll um, walk through a little bit how to use Jensen. Like, uh, I think last year I really liked Jensen, so that we were all doing this in Jensen. I think maybe this year if I would redo my slides, I might do them in Spacey. But, um, so, so I don't really want to force you for the homework to do the Jensen implementation. You can use that and I'll show you how to do it. 
You can also use the word to vec directly, or you can use fast text, or you can use spacey, and all of them are like good implementations. Yeah, so Jensen is a text processing library for, um, uh, for Python. It has wrappers on a lot of fast libraries like uh, Mallet, which I mentioned for uh, latent directory allocation, and Wolfhall Weblet, which also has a very fast latent directory allocation. Um, and it has a bunch of tools for analyzing topic models. So it's mostly around topic models and unsupervised learning. As a representation, it just uses a list of tuples for a bag of word. So the tuple is the index of the word in the vocabulary and then the count, instead of using sparse matrices like, like scikit-learn. So here, um, I think Jensen actually doesn't have a tokenizer. You could use NLTK or Spacey for tokenization. So um, to get started here, I'm doing, using very, very simple tokenization. Uh, here I have these documents, what is my purpose? You bring the butter. And so uh, for each document in the corpus, I do um, lowercase and split it on white space. And so this is basically like a very simple tokenizer. And so I get the list of tokens here for each of the documents. Then um, I can create a Jensen corp corpus of that using corpora.dictionary. And this will now represent uh, the <coughs> vocabulary. And says, OK, there are seven unique tokens. And then it shows me some of the unique tokens. And if I want to use um, this dictionary to get a back of word representation, I can um, I give it the tokens. So again, here is not a string. This is already tokenized with my silly like splitting on white space. And then I can use a dictionary dot uh, doc to back of word. Um, this will go from list of tokens to list of tuples. Where again, so here the what corresponds to the third word in my dictionary. It appears. Oh, sorry, the butter probably corresponds to the third word in the dictionary and appears once, and what corresponds to the fifth word in the dictionary and also appears once. And so, yeah, here you can see just the, the original um, corpus is just. I, I renamed it from. Ten, no. Uh, it's just uh, every token appears once. Great. So uh, I think it, someone asked me this uh, on Monday, so how do you go, go between these different libraries? And the answer is, for every pair of libraries, there's a different way to convert it, which is great <coughs> fun. So here, if we want to use these tools together with scikit-learn, we need to go from these tuples to sparse matrices, or from sparse matrices to these tuples. And uh, you can use gensim.matutils dot uh, corpus to CSC that creates um, CSC sparse matrix. CSC stands for compressed sparse column. Um, that we haven't really talked about different sparse matrix formats, uh, and it doesn't really matter that much to us. Just um, remember CSC is a sparse matrix format. And so here, if I take the corpus, put it as corpus to CSC, I'll get a uh, NumPy Sorry, I get a sci-fi sparse matrix out. The other way around, if I used uh, scikit-learn to create my document, uh, to transform my documents, um, to create a sparse representation of the corpus, then I can use sparse to corpus to uh, actually of the transposed matrix um, to get uh, a sparse corpus which is um, a representation of, these, of the list of tokens. So you can go both ways. You, you can go from uh, Jensen lists of uh, tuples to sparse matrices and from sparse matrices to Jensen lists of tuples. The uh, transformations look a bit different than scikit-learn. They're implemented with 
uh, squared brackets. So here they also have a TF-IDF model. It's just there's a TF-IDF rescaling if you want to apply it to something. So corpus zero is the zeros document in the corpus. And here these square brackets mean apply the transformation. Um, which to me is a little bit of funny syntax for like applying a function, but whatever. I didn't make up the interface. You can also see that this is actually um, somewhat lazy. Um, so if I do tfidf of the corpus, it doesn't actually transform the corpus. It gives me a transformed corpus object, but then if I want to do anything with it, it will actually apply the transformation only once I need it. Okay, so now let's actually use um, virtuvac embeddings. Uh, so that's a skip gram. Yes. Um, and so there's um, from download models, there's things to load uh, different formats. I downloaded the Google News uh, vectors. Uh, so this is a three dimensional. Um, representation trained by Google on Google News. And so basically what this is, is it, this is, has a built-in vocabulary and um, so it has a three-dimensional representation for each word in the vocabulary. The way I get the representation for a single word is again using square brackets. So here this is a NumPy array of size 300 that represents the word queen. And you can see the whole whole thing is uh, 3 million times 300, so there's a vocabulary of size 3 million for which they created this dictionary and shared. So if I have a word that's not in this dictionary, tough luck, I cannot represent it. So that is maybe the, the one downside of using these pre-trained um, representations is if your word is not in, the, uh, in there, then uh, there's not a lot you can do. Okay, so what can we do with uh, these representations now? So the first thing is that uh, people found they're interestingly they have interesting semantic properties, and in particular, um, I think I mentioned this um, when we talked about back of words. So usually. Uh, in NLP, uh, cosine similarity is used to um, measure similarity between words or between documents. So now, before, it wasn't really possible to define similarity of words because each word was just a one-hot vector. And people, if you do a cosine similarity between them, it's always going to be zero. Like, two words are completely unrelated. Now we have this 300-dimensional um, continuous representation, so now can, you can check what words are similar to each other according to this representation. And the distance that we use for this is this cosine similarity, which is basically just measuring the angle between the vectors. Um, Jetsum has this most similar method, uh, which allows me to give, get, get the most similar things to a given word, and here say I want five of them. Um, and so the th top five things that are similar to movies is film, movies, films, mo a misspelled movie, and capitalized movie. So you can see that um, A, they had misspellings in there, even though it's Google News, and B, uh, they didn't change their capital, they didn't lowercase. So uppercase movie is a different token for them than lowercase uh, movie. And so if you feed in your data, you sort of should be aware of that, so that you maybe don't lowercase if you think there's information in that. They apparently thought there was. Um, so this makes kind of sense because, um, so let's think about this training objective again. The training objective was, uh, or things should have a similar representation if they appear in a similar context. And if I have uh, a text and if I replace the word movie by the word film, the text is still gonna be about as likely. Um, and so it completely makes sense that the representation that my model learned for movie is similar to the representation for film because they appear in very similar contexts. Um, 
Okay, so let's do the same exercise for good. So what are the uh, expectations you will have for good? You can think about it maybe for a second. Um, and so when you find the most similar, you get great, uh, terrific, decent, nice, but you also get bad. Um, so most of these are synonyms, and, but bad is an antonym. Antonym? Um, the reason why it shows up here is because they appear in similar contexts. If you say something is bad, it would grammatically usually also make sense that the thing is good. And so you might not be able from the context to say, particularly from like a small context of like five words to say, uh, did they think something is bad or good? And so bad and good actually have very similar representations here. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, what's also interesting what you can do with these representations is look at the average of multiple words, uh, or you don't need to average with cosine similarity, you can just add them. Um, so for example, if you uh, look at the words um, cute dog, so what words are um, similar to cute dog, and you get uh, puppy, chihuahua, adorable puppy, uh, Yorki and Shih Tzu. And so that's kind of cool because um, th these are really capturing the semantics both of single words and of groups of words. So I can say, for this group of words, what expresses this concept? And so just adding the vector for cute to the vector for dog, they're just added, we added these representations and we get a representation that's very similar to puppy. <laughs> And so people were like somewhat surprised by this because it means you can do linear algebra in like a semantic space. You can just add concepts by adding vectors together. Um, so one uh, benefit. question is, why is there an adorable puppy? And actually, um, I'm not entirely sure what happened there. They might be looking at, at common bigrams as well. Like these two words came and uh, treated them as one token, or um, may maybe there was even an adorable underscore puppy in the text somewhere, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I would assume that very common um, word pairs they just keep as a single token. Whereas here, cute and dog are completely separate tokens. They both have a vector representation and they just add 300 numbers plus another 300 numbers. And so, um, this is good news for us uh, in terms of trying to do machine learning on these representations because mostly we get um, synonyms, so we learned about synonyms, we learned about semantic concepts. Um, there's maybe some surprises in that bad and good are very similar, but um, generally we now have a representation where we don't really need to see exactly the same word. Um, if we get if we see uh, puppy and chihuahua, we know that they're re very related. And if we see movie and films, we, s we basically know they're the same thing. So now these are representations for single words. Um, here I showed how you can, if you add two vectors together, you can get something that captures both words. Uh, usually we're interested in machine learning in um, classifying whole documents. One way to do that is to just take the average of all the words in a document. So um, here I just take for each document in my documents, um, I take the word vector and then I compute the mean. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so each document here is a list of words, and so for each token, I take the representation of the, to of the token. So this here is a matrix of, uh, that has all the uh, three-dimensional um, vectors for all, each of the tokens. I compute the mean for that. So I have a single three-dimensional vector for each document. And then I stack them together, so I have a whole data set. 
Oh, here, um, as you might see at this number, this is again my favorite data set, the IMDb movie reviews. Um, if you represent the document in that way, uh, at what point would you run into problems in terms of document length? Because I can imagine that the longer the document gets, the more uh, the different uh, word meanings can cancel, cancel each other out. So uh, the question is, is there a problem if, you, um, if the documents are very long because you average over so many different words? And um, I don't think there's, there's been an, or I don't know of a study for that, but um, I think it still works pretty well. You would, I mean, you would also assume that the, if the document is very long, it's mostly about the same topic, right? If you have completely different topics within the same document, that might be a little bit harder. But if you have a top, a document that's about a single topic, um, sort of just making it longer gives you more information, right? If it's more heterogeneous, then uh, that might be harder. And this is also just the simplest method. There's a more complex method for aggregation, and people played around with this for a couple of years. Um, basically, all of these methods are now superseded by uh, Elmo and Bert. Um, but I still want to go walk through these because this is like conceptually quite simple and uh, still works pretty well. All right, so here I transformed um, my MDME data set. So I have a 300 dimensional uh, representation for each word. And here I train my logistic regression on it. And um, in this case, I think this is possibly slightly worse than what I or I think it's about the same than what I had uh, doing the, the full uh, data set. So here I do set C pretty high because I don't want to regularize because my representation is already very low dimensional. So this is definitely also, uh, if you have a text classification task, I think this would be the, the sort of the second step. I would as a baseline always run a back of word model and then try to look at the coefficients and then as um, as a second step, I would uh, run um, this sort of mean of word to vector representation. This is a, obviously a little bit hard to interpret now. If you look at the coefficients of this logistic regression model, then um, I, I have no idea how to interpret that. Of course, it's in this three-dimensional latent space, which has not really a meaning. So another interesting thing you can do with these vectors, I already said you can do some arithmetic with this. Um, people took this a little bit further. And um, not only are you able to find uh, analogs, but you'll also be able to find relationships. And so um, the classic example here is, uh, well, okay, there's two examples here. Uh, king is to kings as queen is to what? And um, so this would be trying to ask the representation for the concept of plural. And so you could say um, going from king to kings is the same as going from queen to queens. And so if I look at the, um, the vector connecting these two, if I apply the same vector to queen, then I should end up at queens. Here on the left-hand side, there's another example people looked at. It's basically the concept of like, did we learn uh, about the gender of terms? Where you look at, while well, the difference between man and woman, the vector that connects these two is, should be the same as the vector, as the relationship between uncle and aunt or between king and queen. And so the way you would compute this um, is sort of most easily seen in this example here. So you start with um, a queen, and you want to go here and want to see what is over here. If you want to answer the question, king is to kings as queens is to question mark. And um, so you start with queen, and you want to add the difference of uh, kings and king. So you do plus representation of kings minus representation of king. And this would be going along this red vector. And then you have a new uh, representation in this latent space. And then you can look at what is the closest word to this. 
And people found this uh, to work surprisingly consistently. So here, um, this is from uh, the original paper, I think. They basically um, they, uh, took the representation of a bunch of countries and a bunch of capitals and then projected it down to two dimensions by PCA. And you can see that there's like a pretty consistent direction that connects a country to its capital in this, um, this two-dimensional representation. So this is quite, yeah, quite surprising. Like, um, you just take all these points in this three-dimensional space, you, you look at the principal components, and then you see not only do like all the countries are on the left and all the cities are on the right, but also they're basically uh, in the right order. Um, so that's, yeah, somewhat surprising. So, okay, this is just sort of uh, what I said before written down. So this is how people write this logically. A is to B as C is to question mark and you want to figure out a question mark. This is quality um, uh, word analogy task and people were kind of obsessed with that for a while once they figured out they could do this. And so what they, so the computation here is just, this is um, the new, this is basically um, starting at uh, I changed V. Uh, sorry, I changed C to V. Sorry. So I start at uh, C, and um, I go the difference between B and A, and uh, this is a new vector. And now I look at all the vectors I have learned. This is vec i. And I iterate over all of them and I find the one that has the smallest cosine distance. So that's the closest to it. And um, here, this is from a Stanford Deep Learning course. And you can see uh, that it, with the input of Chicago is to Illinois, as Houston is to question mark, it gets Texas. And so basically, um, it gets the state for each. Um, for each city, right? So it learned um, for each city which state it is in. And not only that, but you can query it doing just additions and subtractions on the vector representations. So not only does it capture the semantics, but the semantics are represented by very simple arithmetic. Um, so, Here's an example with Jensen. So this is the um, king is to man as, sorry, man is to king as woman is to question mark. Uh, so the positive are woman and king, the negative is man. Um, and so I get the first three and the highest one is queen, which is sort of the one that we um, expected. Monarch and princess are also pretty high up, uh, which makes sense. And then um, he is to man as woman is to, and you get she, capitalize she and her. And uh, Italy is to pizza, as Germany is to bratwurst, obviously. The Domino pizza, I'm a little bit surprised by this, but, uh, and donuts, we also don't really have donuts that much. Um, well, but no model is perfect. And this is all learned from Google News, right? So uh, maybe that also um, gets some bias, or at least Google News is probably not about food most of the time. All right, so now we have this representation, which um, we can do arithmetic with, which tells us a lot about semantics of words. Um, there are some mm, problems with it. So first, no model is perfect. So here are things we have, eat Domino Pizza in Germany, which we do, really do not. Um, but there's also biases in this, uh, that are learned from the data set. There's this uh, paper with this uh, great title, Man is to Computer Programmer as Woman is to Homemaker. And uh, because this is what, I think they used this word vec model that Google published, and that is uh, what they got out, wh which is not great. And so um, if you use 
any model, of course, if your data is biased, your model will be biased. That's how models work. If you use an unsupervised model, it might be biased in ways that are surprising to you. Like this is, in hindsight, it's not very um, surprising that this model is sexist because uh, it was generated from data from a sexist world, but um, still you should make, might take this into account. Um, so basically here are, um, to, they, basically they, um, in, the, in this paper they have two different types of, uh, of analogies and she says, and they said one is gender stereotypes to be one that's gender appropriate, basically saying, okay, there are some analogies like uh, going from she to he, going from sister to brother, or mother to father, or king to queen, these make sense. Um, but going from cu cupcakes to pizza, or from feminism to conserva um, con conservatism is, um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, Weird. Also going from diva to superstar. Um, yes. So, or from nurse to surgeon. Anyway, but these are still these are a pretty good tool, and a lot of people still use these. And as I said, there's like there's a bunch of implementations, and so I wanted you to play around with this for the homework. Um, questions about analogies or work vectors? So the next thing I want to talk about are paragraph vectors. So it's pretty clear that if we have, uh, we want to, if we represent a document, then just take representing all the words and averaging them is kind of a silly thing to do. We really want a representation for this document. And so paragraph vectors are one of the earlier works. Um, and um, again, now everybody would use unborn birth probably, not paragraph vectors. But uh, these are conceptually a bit more simple, and I thought uh, they have like a have a nice idea behind it. And also, last time I um, I taught this class, this was state of the art, and now no one will ever use this again. So that's interesting because there's like a lot of things happened in the last year in uh, text representation. Like there, there was like a blog post called uh, NLP's ImageNet moment because they finally figured out how to do transfer learning. So. This, all these things often are um, called transfer learning because you transfer the knowledge that you learned on one task to a different task. So all of these uh, word vectors would fall to transfer learning because there was information extracted from this big data set like Wikipedia or Google News, and you transfer this knowledge, this representation, to a different task. And people have done this in um, computer vision uh, basically ever since ImageNet came out. Uh, people had really problems doing this in NLP very effectively, and sort of these word vectors were the first way to do this, but they are not very effective, and the newer methods are very effective uh, comparatively. But before we go to the state of the art methods, I want to talk about um, paragraph vector and doc to back. So, this is basically this came shortly after the word vectors, and the idea is. Uh, to represent a whole document or um, just a paragraph uh, using a lake of representation instead of just averaging the words. And it's quite interesting, the idea here, and uh, it's a little bit tricky to understand, maybe. So the idea is you have the word vectors, they're, called, they're specified as W here, uh, for each word and you learn and you have your big corpus on which you want to train this maybe um, Or a domain specific corpus and so you learn these word vectors But also either for each document or for each paragraph in your document you learn um, Another say a three dimensional representation and This is specific to this one paragraph or to this one document and basically it fixes what the word vectors could not get. So, um, again, to predict, say, the word in the center um, or the word in the context, 
um, as you, we did with the continuous uh, bag of words, we average the word vectors of uh, everything in the context, then we make a prediction. But to this average, we also add a representation for this paragraph. And this is basically just, here it says paragraph ID, so this is a one-hot encoding of the length of the number of documents or paragraphs you have. So you have a separate encoding for each um, document in your training data set. And specific to this document, you get basically the correction of what, um, what do I need to know to predict the word in the context that is not captured by the word representation alone. And so during training, you estimate both the, these paragraph vectors and the word vectors. Um, applying this to a new data set is um, a little bit trickier though, because uh, as I said, the, this paragraph matrix essentially is the size of the training set times the latent dimension. So you, after training, you have a paragraph vector for each paragraph in your data training set. But you don't have them for a test set. So it, for your test set, what you do is you basically need to keep training, you keep fixed the word vectors, and uh, then you do more training um, trying to predict the word in the context um, for the things in the test set, and you compute the paragraph vector that optimizes the performance. So basically, you train more, like you train on the test set, to, or you do gradient descent on the test set to get the paragraph representations. So I think that's kind of cool, even though it's a little bit complicated. Um, so here, um, okay, here's a quick slide showing you how to do this with Jensen. Um, I'm doing this on the um, IMDb data set, of course. So I have some pre-processing from Jensen and I'm tagging it. And um, then I'm training a Dr. Vec model. Um, so actually here, I promised myself to rerun this again because I ran it with a very small vector size and uh, very few epochs uh, because I really am very impatient. So if you increase this, this actually will be much better. Uh, so the results I'm gonna show now are not very good, mostly because I made the model very small. So I gave it only 50 latent dimensions and didn't train it for very long. Um, mostly because I was impatient. Um, but so here, I built a vocabulary and then I trained the model. And so here the training, this will create new word vectors and uh, a paragraph vector for each paragraph. Or uh, here the paragraphs are the whole reviews. And so here I said don't do this, but here basically I trained new word vectors. I could have used the word vectors from uh, word to vec to initialize this, but then I would have, to need, have needed to use 300 dimensional um, uh, word vectors, but I only want to use 50 dimensional ones. And so I learned new ones. Um, so just to see that I learned a little bit, um, something somewhat reasonable, I'm looking at the word vectors uh, that were learned. And if I look at the most similar for movie, I get film, flick, series, program, sequel, story, show, documentary, picture, thriller. Okay, so this means and film and flick are like by far the highest. Okay, this, this seems reasonable. Um, it's a little bit harder to understand what the paragraph vectors are. We could try to look at, for each paragraph vector, what is the closest other paragraph and see if the paragraphs are similar. Um, it is, that's, I found this a little bit tricky and didn't work too well. Um, so here again, I can now use this paragraph vectors as um, a 50 dimensional continuous representation. And uh, usually you would use the paragraph vector plus the average of the word vectors. So what the paragraph vector tries to do is try to 
contained information that is not contained in the average of the words. So if I want to classify, I'm going to take the average of the words and the parallel vector together and concatenate them. So I would have, in this case, a 100-dimensional representation. Uh, here, in this case, this didn't work particularly well. Again, as I said, I, pr I used a very low dimensional um, representation. I didn't train it for too long. Also, I didn't use the whole, there's like an unsupervised data set uh, that, you, that I could have used, and I didn't really do it correctly. If you do it correctly, uh, it's actually going to be pretty, pretty good on this data set. This data set was in the uh, original publication of the, the paragraph vectors. There's um, another method that I want to talk about briefly, which is a glove that people favored for a while afterward to back. This is again um, for doing word embeddings, only instead of doing um, this word prediction task and this context prediction task, what it does is directly works with word co-occurrences and basically does a factorization of the word co-occurrence matrix. Um, or of the log word co-occurrence matrix. So you have a context, again, say five or 10 words, and you count for each pair of words, how often does word J appear in the context of word I? Obviously, you don't, you're not gonna instantiate this whole matrix because it's gonna be a million by a million, and it's gonna be too large, but conceptually, that's what it is. And then, um, what we're gonna do is, given this matrix, we're gonna estimate uh, W uh, I A and W uh, J tilde and B I and B J for each word uh, I and J. So the Bs are uh, scalars and W uh, I are sort of the representation of the first word and the W uh, J are the representation of, well, the first word in the tuple. So you, for each word you have a W and a W tilde. Again, you, you throw out a W tilde in the end. What you care about is, the, uh, is just a W. And so here you can see this is basically a factorization of uh, log of uh, xij. Basically, you want this, the product of these two vectors similar to be xij. Um, they, um, there's one trick, though, and, and this is like least squares. Uh, there's one trick, though, which is they weight how important it is to get the entry right by um, by a function of um, the co-occurrence frequency. So basically, if two words don't appear uh, together very often, it's not very important to get the co-occurrence right. If they appear very often, it's important to get the co-occurrence right, and this. Um, And so that's uh, this thing, and um, this is just a, a monotonous function that um, looks like this. So there's like an x max, and basically uh, after that, everything that has a co-occurrence of at least x max is uh, weighted with one, and things that are rare are uh, weighted like exponentially decaying. And then you can optimize this guy, and then you can get these uh, W's, and these W's are again your uh, word representations. It's using a slightly different um, training objective than the uh, continuous bag of words and the skip grams, but in the end, the outcome is pretty similar. Here is um, a comparison of different um, implementations. So he, here, the glove. This is from the glove paper. So obviously, glove wins. Um, but there's you can see there's SIBO and there's like people came up with all different, all kinds of different ones. And here are different dimensionalities. And you can see that. And the tasks here are um, semantic and syntactic similarity. So there's data sets that have these 
king queen pairs basically and this is how often do, does the model get it right how often does it have the right semantic um, analog or the right syntactic analog and um, so here the 300 dimensional block word vectors uh, trained on what 42 billion words I think that's what this means is um, uh, is doing really great according to the glove author authors but this is also so you can also download this this is also um, yeah an alternative word embedding uh, that's probably also supported in Spacey and um, Jensen Question is, how did they verify they did a good, did a good job? I mean, that, that's a good question. And basically, people were so obsessed with these uh, analogs, they collected data sets. And so there's an annotated data set of like, I don't re remember, like thousands uh, of these uh, pairs um, to validate if it does the right thing. And I mean, there's like, uh, there is, uh, relational knowledge bases that already have this kind of information that know what like a capital is or that know um, how things are related. Uh, but basically, you have a ground truth data set that someone assembled. It could still be biased because someone created it. Oh, the, the comment is it could be still be biased because someone created it. I think the tasks here are um, pretty uh, clear. They're, like. Capital is mostly well defined, and what the and uh, the synthetic the syntactic is like the pro, the plural or something like that, um, and so I think they used like pretty well defined relationships. They didn't use homemaker. Okay. Other questions um, on word embeddings. So. No. Um, so I want to spend the last couple of minutes uh, reviewing a little bit uh, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent um, because this will be um, quite important for training neural networks, which we're going to do next. Um, okay. Who here is familiar with gradient descent? Okay, the rest is on their phone. Good. Um, Actually, let me let me start here. Um, so, gradient descent is a method to minimize any function for which you can compute a gradient. So, you have this capital F, and um, it has some parameters W that are like a big vector or like a flattened matrix, and you want to minimize the function. We saw several examples of this today. For example, the uh, glove objective that I just showed you or the continuous back of word, uh, all of these actually are minimized with gradient descent. You could also do this for the weights in uh, your logistic regression or for neural network or for whatever you want. And the way gradient descent works is you uh, pick an initial point W0 and then you make small steps along the gradient. So here, let's say this is your initial point, the gradient is the tangent, and you make um, steps in the direction of the negative gradient. The gradient is the direction of the steepest ascent, so if you go the other way, it's the steepest descent. So gradient descent is also sometimes called steepest descent. And um, so here you can see um, the next step is the previous step minus eta i uh, times the gradient with respect to w. And eta i here is what's called the learning rate, which says how big a step do you want to take. And so here in this illustration, um, this is a quadratic function, and um, so you get to the global minimum. Whenever you have a convex function, this will converge to the global minimum. If you have a non-convex function, you will only get to a local minimum. And so if the function is convex, it doesn't matter where you initialize because you will always end up in the global optimum. You might go there faster or slower. But if you are um, 
this is an example of a non-convex function. Um, so this is here the heat map gives you the level of the function. And so let's say you start here, you end up here. If I started over there, I might end up somewhere else. Also, if you have a non-convex function, I mean, the learning rate influences where you end up. Generally, the learning rate uh, influences how long it takes uh, to get to the optimum. In a convex setting, that's all it influences. In a non-convex setting, it also influences where you end up. So if your learning rate is too small, you wait forever and ever and never make any progress. If your learning rate is just right, then you make quick progress to your goal. If your learning rate is too big, you might make big steps and might oscillate around your goal. Uh, one very common technique is to start with like larger step sizes and then go down um, and have smaller and smaller step sizes. So this is why this eta depends on i, so the beginning eta is like 0.1 and then in the end it's 0.001. So gradient descent is like a very gen generic method and it's actually, in machine learning outside of neural networks, it's not really used. If you use um, logistic regression or an SVM or something in scikit-learn, it will have much more specialized solvers that work much, much faster. But this sort of is something that if you don't really know a lot about the function and you didn't really think very hard, this would work. The reason why people uh, like this is not um, because they use this sort of gradient descent, but um, because they use a stochastic approximation. So the function we're trying to optimize in, ma in machine learning is usually a sum over all the training points, like the loss over all the training points uh, of our misclassification, for example. So this is what I wrote down here, here's the loss of um, that I have on my training data point xj uh, with the ground truth label xi and then wi is let's say a parameter in my uh, logistic regression. And so I can decompose this and not uh, look at the, well, the gradient of the sum is the sum of the gradients. So I already did the sum of the gradients here. Um, but I, I can also just look at a single part of this sum. This is called off, uh, online or stochastic gradient descent, where we look at a single sample at a time. So the idea is that this is actually a Monte Carlo algorithm in a sense. Uh, we pick a sample at random and we go we compute a gradient with respect to that sample and we make a step in this direction. This is, of course, a very noisy estimate because I only have information for this one sample. But if your step is small enough, um, this might work. And uh, a slight variant of, the, variant of this is what's called mini-batch. In a mini-batch, you just look at, say, k samples. So instead of looking at a single sample at a time and making a step, you compute uh, the gradient over k samples, you average over it, and then um, you make a step in the direction of this gradient. So, and basically if you set k equal to 1, you get stochastic gradient descent, and if you set k equal to the number of samples, you get batch gradient descent. And so there's a, a trade-off here. And of course the, the smaller your batch is, the more noisy the estimate will be, and the more you'll uh, possibly go in the wrong direction. But the benefit of this is that um, you can make more steps with the same amount of computation. So maybe it's very obvious where you need to go and looking at the gradient of only a single sample will already point you in the right direction. And so then you only have to compute the gradient for a single sample to make a step. So this is computationally uh, much cheaper than this. In particular, computing the gradient is expensive. Um, and so um, this is the case for neural networks. Um, 
not so much for linear models, but in logistic regression, there's also, if you have really a lot, lot of data, there's uh, arguments that I just uh, skipped over uh, on why you might want to do stochastic gradient descent. The reason well, mini, why we want to use mini badges is, um, well, A, it allows you to trade off between these two. But one of the main reasons people use mini batches for neural networks um, is hardware reasons. Um, because people use neural networks on GPUs, and GPUs are good at doing many computations at the same time. And so if you compute a gradient for each individual sample here, uh, and then loop over the samples, that would actually be kind of s quite slow compared to computing the gradient for, say, 512 samples as a t at a time, or 64 samples at a time. So one of the main reasons that people use uh, mini batch instead of stochastic learning is not only that it is um, sort of a more stable estimate of the gradient, but also that it better fits into the hardware that we have. Like, even if you don't have a neural network, or if you don't run on uh, GPUs, uh, on C modern CPUs, doing like floating point operations is much faster than doing any decisions. And so if you just do the, a bigger computation thing before you make any decisions, that's usually easier. Um, so here is an example for logistic regression. Um, I didn't actually compute the gradient, but say this was our log loss. And um, now the um, idea behind the stochastic gradient descent is we just take a single sample, we compute the derivative of the log loss, and we take 1 over n times uh, w, which is the regularizer. So I said you basically, the the theory behind stochastic gradient descent often works with you pick a sample at random and you do a gradient step um, because you, you can imagine that is sort of the standard way you would do Monte Carlo algorithm is you pick one thing that's at random. In practice, we usually just iterate over the data set. So we just pick, um, we iterate over the samples and we do one gradient step at a time. And yeah. That's also, so this classic gradient descent is how you would fit any of the models um, we talked about earlier, uh, like the word vectors. So there's um, one part in scikit-learn where you can uh, play a little bit with uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, there's the SUD classifier and SUD regressor. Both of these are just linear models. So um, they implement basically logistic regression, linear SVMs, bridge regression, uh, lasso, elastic net, all of them at, at once. Uh, you can set a loss and you can set a regularizer and then you can tune them, um, or you, you can um, learn them using stochastic gradient descent. The reason why we don't usually use that is because uh, it can be a little bit tricky to tune the learning rate. Um, and if you, your data set is small-ish, these will be slower. If your data set is very big, these will usually be faster. But these also allow you to do, to do um, online learning, meaning um, that you don't have your whole uh, data set or you cannot even load your data set into memory. And um, there is a partial fit method, which, allows, which basically just does um, stochastic gradient steps, and so you can load some data, do stochastic gradient steps, load some data, do stochastic gradient steps. And so if you have data streaming in, or if your data set is very large and you need to read it from disk, um, and you can't load it into RAM, uh, using these might be a good option. Here, here's an example. Um, there's three classes, so I'm Maybe, I, maybe this is iris then. Hmm. Um, so here I'm just using the uh, linear classifier and um, basically you would iterate over batches that say each batch is lo loaded from memory, uh, sorry, it's loaded from disk into memory because they can't all fit into memory. And for each batch I would call partial fit. 
partial fit does a stochastic gradient step for each sample in the data set. Um, if your data set is big, that might be enough. If your data set is small, as it is here, you might want to iterate over this multiple times. So here you need to, ma I'm manually iterating over the data set multiple times, and for each of the, uh, for each of the batches, I, I do um, stochastic gradient steps for each batch, sorry, for each sample in the batch. This is maybe not like the most uh, beautiful interface, but um, it works and uh, it can help you if you have very large data sets. If you have more complex models than, um, uh, than just a linear model, uh, I would suggest using a more complex framework like TensorFlow and we'll start talking about these next Monday. Questions? Sorry, so you're saying that this one also implements some medium model, right? Sorry? Yeah. So then what's the benefit of using this versus using like a regression or choose a different model that's more like a regression? Okay, the question is, uh, what's the benefit of using this instead of using logistic regression with a different solver? Um, in a sense, this is a little bit of an inconsistency in interface. Logistic regression has like four or five solvers in it, uh, but not this one. This is in a different class. It's in a different class for historic reasons. But so the solvers in um, uh, logistic regression they work well for like medium-sized data sets. If you have um, millions or billions of points, this will work better. And so if you have like 10,000 10, samples or 100,000 samples, I would use the logistic regression class. If you have a million samples, maybe I would use this class. All right.